Job creation is critical for development. About 900,000 uh, workers live in $2 a day or less. And also we know that the working conditions in many of the countries are still a challenge. So this requires a new collaborative effort in order to find solutions to the jobs agenda. So with this spirit is uh, how we started the jobs knowledge platform. Uh, with this spirit of collaboration, of bringing stakeholders into the table, of trying to, um, to organize a community that contributes actively to find solutions to the jobs agenda. Technology is changing the way we see and perceive things in terms of the allocation, matching of jobs, uh, in terms of how productivity is being shifted or reallocated across the globe. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, turn to the, to the speakers. So uh, I'm going to ask each of the gentlemen up here to talk a little bit briefly about, for maybe four or five minutes, about what is it that you actually do and why is it interesting? Okay. So my name is Jacob Kornblum. I'm a co-founder of Souktel. We are the first service uh, in the Middle East to match employers with job seekers using mobile technology, uh, addressing a problem that's prevalent throughout emerging markets, which is the lack of good resources for job seekers or labor market entrants to find where employment is located. Um, in the places where we work, which are primarily Middle East, East African, and Asian labor markets, uh, governments are very resource constrained and are typically unable to provide counseling, uh, job centers, or similar types of support for new labor market entrants. Uh, training institutions have similar challenges. Uh, typically, university, college, or even high school campuses across the Middle East or Africa have very little, if anything, in the way of career counseling, job centers, uh, or similar resources. And the private sector is also quite underdeveloped in this regard. Uh, recruitment or uh, hiring services, as we know them here in North America or Europe, are much less prevalent in places like the Middle East or Africa. Um, internet access, of course, is also a major challenge. Uh, most most people in the countries where we work do not have regular access to the web. So you've got all of these factors lining up to impede or inhibit the connection between labor supply and demand, even in places where there are jobs available and there are qualified, willing workers to carry out these jobs. So our team, we're based in Palestine in the Middle East, but we serve about 15 countries in that region and then in East Africa as well, uh, growing into Southern Africa uh, and into uh, South Asia. What we've done is develop a very simple, basic service that can be accessed from any mobile phone using text messaging or audio hotlines. And if you're a job seeker, it allows you to input some information about your qualifications. If you're an employer, it lets you input some information about jobs available. And all of those data are then stored up in a cloud in a way that either labor supply or labor demand can access uh, at their own discretion and can ultimately lead to a face-to-face -face meeting and hopefully uh, a job connection. Um, we have uh, close to 20,000 users in the various markets that we operate in. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of employers using the service on a daily basis. They range from local uh, enterprises or small businesses uh, right up to uh, international institutions uh, and employers. The way the uh, service works from a revenue standpoint is that job seekers will pay a very light premium text message fee. So if you spend two cents to message your friend, you'll spend four cents to access the service, something to that effect. Um, and employers will also pay to post jobs. Um, and through that, the service is able to, in a large part, sustain itself in, in the countries where it operates. We are trying to make a dent as much as we can, uh, help create some organizing principle or some assisting uh, assistance or support in labor markets that are typically disorganized or a little bit chaotic. Uh, my name is Gary Swart. I'm the CEO of a company uh, called Odesk. And Odesk is the world's largest online work platform. Uh, what we do is we enable enable companies to hire, manage, and pay a flexible online workforce. So the problem we're all aware, with is, uh, aware of is that the jobs typically don't exist where the talent lives. And historically, we've tried to solve this problem by bringing the worker to the work. What Odesk is doing is we're leveraging the internet to bring the work to the worker. So we have over 300,000 businesses on Odesk that are coming to us to find the right talent from around the world. They're posting their job requirements, they're searching our database looking for that perfect worker. They're um, 
uh, this is a talent they can't find in their local geography. They're accessing over 1.6 million contractors that we have in our network. These are contractors from all over the world. Uh, in descending order by hours worked last month, it's uh, Philippines, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, U.S. is fifth, um, Ukraine, Russia, Poland, and then 140 countries from there. So what we've done is we've leveraged technology and the internet to enable every worker to create their own profile and to be searchable, take tests, prove they have the skills they say they have, determine their own hourly rate. And rather than physically going to work on premise, they're working via the internet through our patent pending technology to enable companies to manage that worker by walking around via the internet. Specifically what our platform does is it takes a screenshot of my desktop six times an hour at random intervals to enable the client to course correct me in real time. Through this technology, we can guarantee that an hour billed is an hour worked, and an hour worked is an hour paid. We guarantee work to the client, we guarantee payment to the contractor, regardless of where they are in the world, and we facilitate the movement of money and all statutory as the back end of the service. We're not charging the contractor to belong to the network. We're not charging the client to post a job. That's free. We only make money if payment goes through our system. The more availability of digital technologies in the developing world in the last 10 years has created this um, climate where we're right now seeing a ton of uh, experimentation and some things actually coming to scale of uh, different ways of, of, of uh, supercharging the labor market. Right. So we've got you know these online job listings. We've, we've got uh, the working remotely. Um, Whereas before, somebody really could only consider uh, selling their labor um, or trying to kind of you know, get some inputs and, and make a go of it for their family uh, in their neighborhood, and they may hold down five different fractional jobs with their, with their family. Now maybe these things are, are a little bit helpful. And what we're seeing is a lot of kind of organic, um, uh, constructed uh, networks of opportunity seeking. So people use the, the phones not just as a pure replacement for their local networks, but as uh, a way to empower, you know, supercharge their local networks. So you get a customer, yeah, um, and now you can keep that customer more easily. Uh, we've seen a great uh, kick up in, in both productivity and in customer search and market opportunities, all this coordination that can be done with the simple technologies. I had the impression as an um, American watching TV during the Arab Spring that Basically, everybody in the Middle East is now on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, social media is now the norm of communication. But you all, you were there yet, were disabusing me of this notion. Yeah. So what's the penetration of these social media in these emerging markets that we've been talking well, about? Well, as we were saying, I mean, the Dubai School of Government uh, has issued uh, an Arab social media report, which I believe is, is, is one of the first of its kind, if not the first of its kind. Uh, and the bank as well uh, issued a practice note last year on uh, new technologies uh, new technologies and their ability to address labor market challenges. Uh, the bank presented actually an interesting statistic, which still kind of surprises me. Uh, that on aggregate across the Arab world, uh, only 1% on average of citizens have internet access. Now, I think that probably represents a very broad distribution curve. To me, it strikes me as a bit low. But I will say uh, in Palestine, which is on the higher end of access to technology, the most recent statistic says that it's really only about a third of people who have internet access at the best of times. Facebook and Twitter usage in countries like Egypt, for example, uh, or uh, at a penetration level of 10% or less. This is what the Dubai School of Government uh, report revealed. So everyone was very excited, I think, during the Arab Spring about the role that Twitter was playing in mobilizing people and, and Facebook, and no doubt it did. But the vast majority of, of Egyptians, and we run a couple of services in Egypt, as well as Palestinians, Tunisians, Moroccans, all countries where we're active, are still using very basic technology. And that is going to take a while in terms terms of uh, its ability to advance and to also reach people in, in rural communities. Um, price point for mobile phones is lower. However, with the advent of the computer or even the laptop, I'm sure we were having this discussion 15, 20 years ago saying, well, in 20 years' time, every household will have a computer because the price is going to come down. And I'm sure at the advent of electricity or piped water, people said the same thing, and it hasn't happened. So, uh, you know, these low-cost devices are much more uh, readily spreadable, their potential for growth is much faster, and no doubt we will see it. But I think we need to be cautious at the same time and really think about uh, the way this technology 
can spread. And one of the solutions is you know, making internet accessible through mobile access points, mm -hmm. having computing centers where people can come from villages and do their ODESC work at a centralized location. The, this, the, the availability of the internet is a constraint in some settings and you know, rural settings and all. Um, then the speed and quality of the connection remains a constraint. And then there's, there's the price issue, which is twofold. It's not just what you pay for the connection, but how you pay for the connection. Professionals, people maybe going to be contract workers, anybody who can afford a monthly connection can get into a situation where they, they, uh, they have a plan. And they, they pay for unlimited or nearly unlimited bandwidth. Um, and, that's, and that's how the internet's been built. Um, and that's, that's a nice place to be. Um, for the, the third, fourth, fifth billion people joining the internet um, through their mobile phone for the first time, a lot of them will be priced by the bit um, as they pay out of airtime. And there are implications for that about what those models are going to be for inclusion. Jonathan, so wh what are the two or three questions that you think we most need to answer to figure out where we're headed in this area of using mobile and internet technology to improve the wages and living standards of workers in the countries of the ones we're talking about? Um, what are the what are the sectors that are most ripe for transformation here? Um, and literally at the level of, if we're talking about small enterprise or people who have the, the, the choice of being um, a small business person on their own or going and finding a, a job in the formal sector somewhere, where, where are the places where we want to kind of encourage that migration over to formal jobs? Where are the places where in a, in a more digitally empowered, digitally charged uh, environment, even in resource constrained settings, people can use uh, things like their phone or their smartphone or access to the, the, the cloud or whatever to make a go of being self-employed or become an employer um, uh, in, in the next five years, you know. Uh, so that evidence is still not entirely available. Um, so you're talking about what kind of industries, what kind of workers, what yeah. kind of countries? I think, yeah, and those are all like parts of the mosaic, right? But if the first stage was um, getting that network in place, you know, just getting simply the, 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 the mobile cellular network to cover 90% of the people on Earth, um, and the handsets to be cheap enough and the prepay models to be good enough that anybody could self-organize and use the technology as best they could. That, I mean, we, we, we kind of see where that's going right now. It's already a good thing. But it's this next level of, of innovation where we're building platforms and, and places for exchange and, and you know, vertical specific things in agriculture, for example, where um, it's just this great, it, it's, a, it's a great period of, of experimentation. Is there no downside to this whatsoever? Oh, do I have to answer that yes. one? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 th I think that the unease about how little room for ever, error and how global some of these uh, competitive marketplaces are is on to something. That, you know, that we talk about livelihoods again, that, that people who have the, um, previously were just competing with a small pool of, of talent to figure out how to make money in, in city X now are, are competing with people all across the world. Um, and that, that does mean, I, you know, we will bring out the best in, in people, and it also is a, a different scenario than, than we've become accustomed to. So I think there are some real uh, tensions around that. But, and then completely different from the platform or anything like that is, is just skills, right? That, that, you know, you're still only as valuable as the skills you can market yourself having. I mean, in terms of skills, I think, uh, you know, we will add technological aspects to the way that the working world and the labor market is shaped, but it still is a labor market at the end of the day. So you're still going to have to warn and demonstrate that you possess the skills you purport to have. Um, and, uh, you know, there are tremendous opportunities to build your skills by participating in an ODESC-like environment or a souptel like environment. Uh, but again, I mean, I believe that supply and demand and the constraints and the challenges that are implicit in that kind of equation will, will persist. Uh, if you say that you're an excellent worker, you're going to have to demonstrate it. Uh, by the same token, if you uh, get matched with a job through our service, you do still have to go to an interview, demonstrate to the employer that you're capable of doing the job, and they'll find out fairly quickly whether that's the case. So uh, some of the baseline issues and uh, challenges and opportunities, I think, are going to remain the same even if we uh, strap the facade of technology onto it. But in terms of access, I mean, that's, I think, where the real, uh, the game-changing multiplier is going to be. Uh, whereas, you know, job opportunities opportunities and, and employment positions were previously limited to people who had good social networks, 
good resources, good upbringing, good education, this is really going to democratize the labor market so much more. Increasing access to those uh, who have not previously been able to participate in the labor market is, is something that this technology can really help.